Hello and welcome to this exclusive Revelation TV interview. I'm here in the Israeli Embassy to interview Maureen Lipman, famous British actress. Maureen, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to interview here, especially here in uh, the Israeli Embassy in London. Yeah, nice gig. Very nice gig. <laughs> Can you share something about your background? Because you are so familiar to our viewers. You're a household name. You've starred in films like The Pianist. Uh, you've starred also in Casualty, Coronation Street, and many other very well-known and popular TV I've programs. I've been around a long time. This is my 50th year. So yeah, if I hadn't been starring in a few things, it would be a bit sad. I should be stacking shelves somewhere if I hadn't got it on by now. I couldn't, I couldn't believe that. But where did, it, where did it all start for you? I know that uh, you were born in Hull after World War II. Can you share something about uh, your Jewish family and what it was like to grow up as a, a Jewish girl in Hull? Well, I suppose there's a, there's a bit of a, a schism always uh, in being an ethnic minority. Uh, I just knew that I had my friends at school and my friends at the weekends. I knew I was Jewish, I was proud, I liked the fact it kept me out of school assembly and that I could choose what I ate at lunchtime and, <laughs> uh, and we were an observant family but not uh, an orthodox family. We probably had kosher meat and there was only one uh, Jewish shop which only opened on a Sunday, and curiously enough, was one of the few places where men would be seen shopping in those days. It was not regarded as effeminate to shop as it was for the rest of them. My dad was a con you know, very um, uh, uh, ordinary, uh, well, he was extraordinary, of course, but um, he was a trader. He had a shop that uh, was a gents' outfitting shop. It was, it was um, idiosyncratic in its way. Um, he was a personality about town a bit. Somebody told me recently that they'd gone in and, and asked for a shirt and he'd shown them a shirt and, and, and the guy said, and I said to your father, that's exactly what I want, Mr. Littman, but I want it darker. And your father turned the light out. And that's pretty much, that sums up my father's shop. My mother was a housewife. She had dreamt of, of, of doing, being a performer in her youth, but of course you didn't, and there was no money if you did, and one didn't know where to go. And in actual fact, she didn't have the, the right kind of personality. She might have been a good actress, but being a good actress is never enough. You have to get the job. And my mother, was, who was much more beautiful than I ever was, or will be, um, would not have got the job. Um, she was wonderfully ingenuous uh, and very funny, but in a way that she didn't know she was funny. And the family was a typical um, northern family, um, uncles and aunts on my father's side and only one uncle on my mother's side. Politically, my father once stood for the Labour Party, but he did actually believe in sort of hanging and flogging, so I don't think he really knew quite what he meant. My uncle Louis, on the other hand, my, father, my mother's brother, was Lord Mayor of Hull. Less strong socialist, worked his way up from, you know, working in East Yorkshire buses to having his own company, and then worked for the Labour Party, as did his wonderful wife Rita, for the rest of his life. Uh, so, and there is a bit of a tradition in Hull for, you know, Jews, Working in the community, we had a, Leo Schultz was a prominent uh, Lord Mayor. You know, we look, we get involved to our cost. We want to make the world a better place. It's part of our heritage that we do that. Um, and yes, I went to uh, a, a, you know a, a Hebrew school on a Sunday morning. Hated it, and I went to the in order to meet boys. I went to the B'nai B'rith and uh, somehow my brother managed to ensure that I didn't meet any boys who, who he knew. Um, <laughs> and it was a sexist world in that, although we were encouraged to, to study, the main objective was to find a nice Jewish husband, yes. And um, when the BBYO sent my brother to America as a representative, it's quite comical now because he stopped being Jewish as soon as he got there <laughs> forever. Um, uh, the next year they, they asked me to go um, to represent England and of course my parents wouldn't let me go. A girl going off like that? No, no way. Um, and I was the entertainer at school amongst my very arty crowd at this school. And we had a brilliant English 
um, uh, English teacher. We had her for four years, and she completely changed all our all our outlooks on literature. We did plays like Dr. Faustus in an all-girls school, and I played Dr. Faustus. Got the best review I've ever had before or since, at the age of thirteen or something. Although it did cause a bit of a stir when I kissed Helen of Troy and said, "Is this the face that launched a thousand ship?" Um, I did elocution. I did. Um, musical festivals, um, with a, uh, that's what you did. And then uh, once I'd done my A-levels, I mean, I think I was bright enough, not as bright as my brother, he consistently tells me, uh, I applied to go to drama schools. I was turned down by one, I was accepted by the other. Hull Council paid my grant, Amazing. all my, you know, we're, I'm the baby boomer man, I mean, we had it all, we mm -hmm. had it all. As, we had no war. We were the good guys as Jews. We were respected and we given. Oh boy, had we given. <laughs> and uh, we, we, it can never be that good again, I don't think. So they paid my living as well. You know, and I think of now what a, a young person go, would go through. I get letters all the time saying I've been chosen out of a thousand people to go to RADA, but I can't pay the fees. Well, you know, f fees are very little to do with, ta you know, the ability to pay a fee is very little to do with, with talent. And so a lot of people are being lost. I was also fortunate enough, blessed, to come out of Lambda at a time when northern people who spoke like I spoke, who were not, you know, received pronunciation, we didn't have that, you know, and, and so I came out into a, a, a performing world which welcomed people like me. Where, where did your passion for uh, the performing arts stem from? Was it stem from your mother's influence or was this something that you just end up realising that you had a talent and a gift for and you wanted to pursue? I, you know, I think I was born funny and it's partly my father and his dry wit, it's partly my mother and my brother's funny and the talent to actually make that into performance just seemed to be there. I was imitating people, I was imitating my teachers, I was arranging shows at, at, um, at school, which now I look back on were pretty sophisticated parodies of what I'd seen on the television, on the Bush 12-inch television. Um, uh, and the whole school would come onto the field at the end of every term, and my little gang would entertain them regally. I give 100% and more if I can. Um, and generally I get on with, with I've been, you know, I've, I've, I've managed to have a family, which is quite a miracle really. And they're, t they're sort of fairly normal, both of them. Um, and have a long marriage and survive bereavement. Um, I don't know what it'll be like now I'm 70 because I'm not a classical actress, or I'm not allowed to be, if you put it that way. I've never, ever, in 50 years, been asked to do a classic, other than I played the Princess of France in Love's Labour's Lost on television and received a letter which I have framed on my wall from Sir John Gielgud. And that that part was given to me by a director called Elijah Mashinsky. Amazing. I'm making a point, and it's a little of a crude point, but I think it is, it is quite hard for English casting directors and people to see you, particularly when you're vocal like I am about being Jewish. And at first, you see, when I start, you know, when I sort of got my first jobs that were seen by many people in the 70s, and Agony was this TV series which um, catapulted, I think is the word. You know, at that point I was sitting on a lot of sofas in front of Parkinson and Terry and Terry Wogan and people like that, and talking about my funny Jewish family, which was unusual in those days. It was quite unusual. I don't know anyone other than the sort of the entertainers, Al McCogan, Frankie Vaughan, just the entertainers. But for an actress, a young actress, to be sort of upfront and, and uh, satirical about where they've come from, it didn't happen much. And that also is the case with my first book, How Was It For You? A book of anecdotes about the life of someone who hadn't really lived. 
you know, that was, that was jammy. It, that went to the top of the charts. Now, I mean, all you have to do is, you know, go into the Big Brother house and rip your tights and you can get a 200,000 book deal with Simon & Schuster, you know, it's, it's yeah. the way it's gone now, anybody. But in those days, the only people who wrote autobiographical books were people who'd had a life. Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall, <laughs> they did it their way. You know, what had I done? But, but the point is that the, the, the angle on life that perhaps I was born with, I've been able to apply to everyday life. And my late husband used to say to me, you know, God, I go out for a bag of sugar, I come back with a bag of sugar. You go out for a bag of sugar, you come out with a three-act play. <laughs> and that is the truth, I do. Where, where, was, uh, where did you have your first break in, in show business, in, the, uh, in acting? Well, it depends what you mean by a break, Simon. I, I, I got my first job at the Watford Palace Theatre playing Nancy in The Knack, which was a very seminal play of its time. Again, sort of working class Northern. Uh, and, and, and that led to other work. Um, and very quickly, I got um, the film of Up the Junction. Now, that was unusual because it had been a big television play by the sainted Ken Loach, <laughs> a man who's very happy to sit next to a Chinese film director, but not an Israeli one. Um, uh, he, the sainted Ken had uh, written this television, this, uh, produced this television play for Up the Junction, which made a big inroad into social change. It was good, it was good, and, and poor cow and a lot of the other things. But when it came to the film, it was a bit more glitzy. Uh, sadly, although when you look at it now, it's it's quite it's not a bad film at all, but it was perceived as not nearly dark and grainy enough, far too pink, and it was directed by a man called Peter Collinson, and it's an old story, so I don't want to bore anyone who's ever heard it. But in order to get this job, being as it was all Cockney, and that was part of what it was about. Um, the agent told me to pretend to be genuine Battersea, uh, and, and I did. And I, I got through the audition, I got the job, and I kept up talking like that. For 13 weeks of filming, I never let on that I wasn't the real McCoy, because I daren't. I thought they would fire me. And it was only after seeing the rushes for the first time, when I was horrified by my appearance, as every actor is, uh, um, that I broke down and the director was hor astonished to see this tough little cookie crying. And I said, I told him, I'm not a Cockney, I'm from Hull. And he said he was from Grimsby and he was pulling the same gag. And how did I, how did I think he got the rights to make the picture for 200 quid? So, mm. so uh, yeah. Uh, the ability to walk in and make someone think that you are a better version of what they had in their head is something that is very lucky if you've got it. What would you say are the key ingredients to your success? Anyone who's watching this interview that has aspirations to become an actor, what would you say those key ingredients they need? Well, you must have intelligence. I don't mean intellectual intelligence, I mean you must be observant of your fellow man and you must have all the emotions within you. And it helps if you're personable, you get on with people. Uh, it helps if you're chameleon-like, as Kenneth Tynan said about Sir Laurence Olivier. When you're with him and you meet someone, he spends 30 seconds summing up what they want him to be and 10 seconds becoming it. That's a good trait to have. Not perhaps in life, because then people never really know you. But in this business, if you can you know, switch on a, turn on a sixpence, become what they want. Maureen, you played a, a very powerful role uh, playing a Jewish mother in the film uh, The Pianist, which was a very powerful and emotionally driven film about the 
evil that it was the Holocaust. Um, did you learn anything by playing that role? Did that um, bring uh, the reality of what the Jewish people across Europe would have faced during those horrific dark days of the Nazi years during the 1930s and 40s? I think the experience of being put into a, loaded into a cattle truck was one of the most ex vivid and frightening experiences I've ever had. Um, and that was just for 10 minutes, you know. Uh, uh, the point is, Simon, that my generation, we were not given the facts about the Holocaust. You know, this is why the wonderful Smith family have opened the Holocaust Museum in at Beth Shalom, because people are not taught. We sort of know it, as we know a lot of things about history, but it was not spoken about in my house. It was not spoken about at school. And I was in my 20s before I really understood what happened and connected it with myself. There was very much a feeling of better you don't talk, better you don't mention, better the kinder don't know. So you know, it was too close. And, and now in retrospect, it's too far because now it's all too easy for deniers to say, well, that's just what Steven Spielberg says, isn't it? He, can, he makes it up, he gets people to say it. You know? uh, and thank God for people like Steven Spielberg who have put the evidence on film. Not that that will make any difference, you know. If, if, if the bigots of the world choose to believe that no Jews went to work on 9-11, they can find ways to justify that. And, of course, like, hugging back to your previous question, what, you know, what have I... What have I what do you need to succeed? Well, I mean, one of the things that is helpful, is, to keep, is, is, is unhelpful, is to keep being opinionated as I am and as I've grown more opinionated as I've grown older and as I've realised that the time of milk and honey for the Jewish population is perhaps depleting slightly and that we're about to come into another time of, of um, uh, if not persecution, then the finger, the finger, as Neil Simon, the finger is approaching, you know, economy's bad. Uh, and when the economy dips, as I told Radio LBC once, there's not a Jew in the world who doesn't start looking at the packing cases. So I have written seriously on the subject and I have spoken and I have championed Israel because I must, because it's, it's, it's imperative that a Jew stands up and talks because we can get complacent, you know, as, as, as all minorities do when they feel integrated, you know, when in the last uh, war you had Hungarians saying, but I'm Hungarian, I fought for the Hungarian army. Didn't make any difference to our friend at all and, and it, it, it won't make any difference to the Jews who berate Israel. They're still going to be, they're still going to have a tough time, the ones who stand up and, and expect um, a, a, a small democracy surrounded by enemies to behave in a completely different way from anywhere other young country in, in the world, including the states. It's hugely important that people who have had a good life as I have had and a good career and have embraced as much or as little of my Judaism as, as I have needed. It's worked for me, it's worked against me, it's, it's, it's as much part of what I am as my northern character and the fact that I'm a woman, <laughs> the fact that I'm a funny woman, whatever. It's, 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 it's part of me and if I don't speak up, then who will? You know. uh, personally, I'm pleased that you do speak up because uh, I, I think when we look particularly at Europe, we look at the continent of Europe, we're seeing escalating levels of anti-Semitism, the likes that we haven't seen since the 1930s and 40s. Uh, we see the Jewish community there in fear because of Islamist terrorist attacks. And because of political correctness, we can't really identify where the major problem's coming from, and that's um, Islamic extreme ideology that is targeting the Jewish people and mm. now we're seeing the repercussions that um, first the Jewish people are attacked and then we're seeing mainstream society being attacked particularly this summer 
in France and in Belgium and also in Germany as well. How important is it that Western governments get to grips with this evil that is due hatred? Oh gosh, it's, it's how important is it for the world? I don't know. It's very important for me that they get to grips with it before it goes too late. And it's rife in the Labour Party and the this is not my Labour Party anymore. The Chakrabarti whitewash is shameful. The fact that Corbyn the fact that Corbyn claims to be uh, against all racism and yet would chat happily to a man who just attacked a Jewish MP, called her a lobbying for the Tory graph and, you know, and instead of saying, which is what he should have said, instead of standing up and saying, this is exactly what the review was all about. Leave the party, leave the room, don't come back. He chose to slap him on the back and have a laugh with him afterwards. You know, we have no hope from any of those momentum people who really want to bring about a big change in society and want to reject Parliament. So that's my party gone. <laughs> um, as far as Europe is concerned, we should be afraid. We have um, the right wing the right wing jumping and uh, thrusting its ugly head above the world of liberalism, liberalism that we've known in, 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 in France, in Hungary, in Denmark, in Poland. And we have to understand that the playing field for Israel is steeply terraced, <laughs> unlike any other playing field in the world. They have to be not just with the law, above the law, like Caesar's wife, they must be above the law. And Jewish friends say that to me. They say, you know, well, they should just, they have to be better than any. No, I say they don't. They're a young country surrounded by people in, whom's, in whose constitution it is written that they must be destroyed, who are a country that is called the catastrophe. Now, I, I mean, I may be naive, Simon, but I don't understand the right to return. Because as far as I can see, nobody in history has ever had the right to return. Who's had the right to return? I mean, from day one, we've been pillaging other people's countries and never giving it back. Rhodesia, it was grabbed from us, the empire was grabbed. We didn't gave it back. Nobody does that. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just not, not ever. My partner was thrown out of Egypt along with 850,000 other Jews in 1956. Nobody gives them the right to return to their businesses and their beautiful houses on the Nile that they had to leave behind. It simply doesn't happen. Um, and I don't notice my friends, uh, the anti-Israel, the Israel bashers, the, the, the actors and the uh, horrible heads of parliament who uh, take every opportunity to, to criticise Israel. I don't notice them when I'm campaigning for Burma. I don't see them there against the military there. I don't see their concern about Rwanda or the Sudan. I don't hear from them um, about anything that's happening in the world. But you can't say that. You can't say that because you're accused then of, oh, okay, here we go, what aboutism? Maureen, we're living through extraordinary times, uh, and, and I mean that in terms of that we're really seeing the restoration of the nation of Israel and the Jewish state we haven't seen for over 2,000 years in fulfilment of biblical prophecy, and we're seeing that Israel is a beacon of light in the Middle East. Um, what does Israel mean to you? I don't like, I mean, I don't like injustice. That's, that's, that's where I'm coming from. I want that level playing field. I want them to find their way as a young country to continue doing the good they're doing to be a safe haven for people all over the world in the diaspora. We are, we are used to being on the move <laughs> and to having to start again and of being immigrants. We are born immigrants in our souls. But to have a place there 
which would which would welcome my my children certainly would welcome me uh, is 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 vital, and they've got so much to give. They're so bright, and they make mistakes. Of course, they make mistakes. Every country does, constantly. Um, but they also contribute hugely. You know, it's a situation where someone like Stephen Hawking, who's gone to Israel many times and is wearing an Israeli invention which allows him to speak, to refuse to go to Israel. You see, pe they're being got at by those who wish them not to be there. And the fact that they are so productive and so successful is a thorn in the flesh of those who want a medieval society. They want to see that place turned back into a desert. But I want people to go there and just see the, the tiny innovations that they've come up with, you know, using owls to catch mice in crops rather than pesticides. And um, such, such, every invention you look at, if you read about science at the moment, there's always a little part there that's been invented by the Israelis. We've got so much to give the world. If they just stop picking on us, singling us out as a pariah state, that was given. That was not taken, it was given. And the United Nation is about as useful as the Eurovision Song Contest and as corrupt. And you have a situation in the world where intelligent people accept that there are 60 odd resolutions against this tiny besieged nation of Israel. And I think maybe one against Syria, maybe none against China, 500 executions a year, censorship. I don't know that there are any against Russia who have just marched into another country and taken it, but there are 60 odd, including one about women's positions in Israel. This is all, you know, voted against by people who don't allow women to drive and make them cover their heads with black bags. So, you know, Jonathan Swift would have a heyday coming back in today's society. It makes no sense. And uh, can you, uh, do you have a message for Christian and Jewish viewers uh, who are passionate supporters of Israel to encourage them? Please come and see Jesus. Please come and see the rabbi. It's, um, we're all one. We're all one. It's the only message. Make up your own minds. Go on a tour. See what they've done. See what they've achieved. See the history. Understand the, what they've had to put up with, how they've had to defend themselves, why they've had to take more territory. Put yourself in their shoes. And, 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 uh, and you will understand. Maureen, I want to thank you so much for giving us this opportunity today to interview you, to uh, talk about your life and your passion for Israel and your defence of the Jewish people. Thank you.